Hello. Good morning. Good morning. My name is Rick Dildon. I'm the artistic director at the Alabama Shakespeare Festival. I want to start with a few thanks. I want to thank Prevail Coffee for donating coffee this morning. Thank you, Prevail. I want to thank the Cahaba House for donating the biscuit bar. It's the first time, the first time I've ever publicly thanked a biscuit bar. <laughs> and it was delicious, so thank you so much, Cahaba House and Prevail. Support for the Conversations at the Crest is provided by the Alabama State Council on the Arts, the National Endowment for the Arts, and the AARP. Thank you. <laughs> we cannot make this happen alone. We have had some great community partners join with us to get the word out and also bring folks together for conversation. So I want to recognize a few of our community partners and give them a moment to tell you a little bit about themselves. First, one of our treasures here, the Rosa Parks Museum at Troy University. Good morning, my name is Donna Weissel. I am the education coordinator at the Rosa Parks Museum. And we have a couple of events that are upcoming up, or they're coming up that I would like to share with you. One is the Rosa Parks birthday celebration this upcoming Monday, February 4th, on what would have been Mrs. Parks' 106th birthday. We will have free admission all day. We will have birthday cake served in honor of her around lunchtime. We will have free music beginning at 9.30. We will have story time beginning at 9.30, running throughout the day. And we are very honored to have a special presentation from ASF's Four Little Girls performing at four o'clock that afternoon that will also be free of charge. So we invite you to come out, celebrate with us on Monday. We are open nine to five. And then on March 19th, we are also having a community forum on religious tolerance and so we are hoping to get the community together to discuss issues that face us every day but work through solutions to bring us all together so i want to thank rick and asf for allowing us to participate in this event today thank you and we hope to see you at the museum next up our friends from the freedom rides museum And finally, our friends from the Medical Advocacy and Outreach. Good morning, my name is Nisi Dancy, and I'm with Medical Advocacy and Outreach. I'm the community, I am the manager of community education, and we're so thankful to be here today. So we are very thankful for the invite. Um, we do have a few events coming up. Um, we do have, um, first of all, national HIV Awareness Day is February the 7th. That's um, National Black HIV Awareness Day. So we want to make sure that we're raising awareness about that, getting tested for HIV and knowing our status. That's one thing. And then on March the 14th, we have Alabama HIV Awareness Day. And that will be located at the Double Tree Hotel, 120 Madison Avenue. And that is going to be March the 14th. So save the date. And we also have several other events coming up. We have Queen Bee. That will be March the 16th. And we have, um, we will show, be showing Nothing Without Us. It's a documentary of how women are taking the fight against HIV. 
and um, that we'll be showing that at the Capri on March the 16th. And if you want more information about our events that we have coming up, please come out and visit our table because we do have several things coming up. Thank you again for having us. So the mission of Alabama Shakespeare Festival is to build community by engaging, entertaining, and inspiring people with transformative theatrical performances and compelling educational and community programs. We started these conversations at the Crest, and this is the first one we've had. We're kicking it off, and I want to thank the Crest on Dexter for allowing us to come together as a community. Thank you. We started the platform. We started these conversations as a means of bringing folks together after hearing a story, after coming together in the dark, and now coming together as a community to talk about what we've heard. By no means is this all about the shows at Alabama Shakespeare Festival, though we'd love you to come to all of them. <laughs> but it's about what is the stories we're telling and how do we come together as a group to talk about them. Right now we have two plays going on at Alabama Shakespeare Festival by the same playwright, Christina Hamm, who will be with us later on this afternoon. The first is Four Little Girls, Birmingham, 1963, that looks at the lives of young people, specifically the four individuals who lost their life, and imagines who they would have become. What did they dream for themselves? We have produced the show entirely with 24 Montgomery Public School students. <laughs> Theater, we're producing a play called Nina Simone, Four Women, that is a theatrical imagining of Nina Simone the day after the bombing of the 16th Street Baptist Church. And she, along with three other women, the four women in Nina Simone's famous song, arrive at the site and they ask some important questions. One of the biggest ones is, what does it mean to be a black woman in America today? Today we have an I'll call it a rock star panel, <laughs> to talk about civil rights, stories from the movement. Our panelists today, Trinity Ross, <laughs> is a student from the Washington and is one of the stars of Four Little Girls. We have Lisa McNair, who is a national public speaker and the sister of Denise McNair. We have Ms. Doris Crenshaw, who's a civil rights icon, a protege of Rosa Parks, and is also the director of the Southern Youth Leadership Development Institute. And our U.S. Congresswoman, Terry Swift. Our conversation is facilitated by Shakita Jones. Thank you, Shakita.
you to feel comfortable engaging with us. Okay, so when we talked about the, the plays and having a conversation about poor little girls and Nina Simone, I felt as, as I, I've seen both of the plays and I want, I want to encourage you that have not seen the play to go see both of them. You need to see them both so you can really make the connection. They're, very, they're two very different conversations. You know, four little girls, um, we're talking about these, these young little girls whose lives were cut short and just leading up to, to that event. Nina Simone is very different. We're talking about women. There's issues that resonated with me as I saw the play about colorism, <coughs> sexism in the movement, movement classism these things that continue to plague us in the black community and as women. So what I would like for us to do is just talk about those things. We're gonna talk about them separately. We're gonna you know, work with poor little girls first and then we'll, we'll handle um, Nina Simone. But I want us to be able to talk about that, have honest dialogue, talk about our, our, our allies in the room, what does it mean to be an ally and, and, and how, we, how we continue to move forward. And then the most important thing is what, what torch do we pass to the young people in the room? And that's why I'm glad they're here because we're, we're demonstrating how we come together as a community, how we talk about our issues, and how we make just mutual connections. So is everybody good? <laughs> all right, all right. Um, so let's just get started. So when, when I watch Four Little Girls, uh, one of the things that kept coming up was say their name. You know, when we, when we make the connection of the bombing and we make the connection of a lot of the brutality and the things that happen today, a lot of times we dehumanize people by not connecting them to their names and their families. So one of the interesting things when I talked to Denise McNair's sister, Lisa McNair, this week, one of the things I was interested in when I was talking to her family, she explained to me that you know she wasn't born when this happened, and at that time, Denise was an only child. So imagine a family losing their only child, their only, their only child, and having fertility issues. So think about that. Did you know what to tell her? I mean, I mean I want you to talk to us a little bit about um, when, I, when you came along and the, the grief that I'm sure was still there with your mother and her parents are still living. So this is grief that you don't get past. You know, her parents are still living. And um, tell us a little bit about how you how you came to know about your sister and the event that happened. Okay, good morning. Thank you for having me, first of all. Um, yes, I was born, Denise was the only child, like she said, and my parents did have fertility issues, and so they weren't sure they would have any other children. So when Denise was killed, it was extremely even more tragic. But God is good and he is faithful. Yes. And almost a year to the day that she was killed, I was born. And then four years after that, my parents had another child. So um, we were doubly blessed in that respect. But um, people ask me about the bombing and when did I know about Denise? And I can never really say because it's something that I've always known. I imagine that adults talked about that around me all the time. So I just always knew it. And when we were younger, Mama would take us to the cemetery with her all the time. And sometimes she was good, and she'd just stand there and we'd talk. And sometimes she wasn't good, and it was a tough day. And um, so and there's a picture of Denise that's been in our living room all of my life, and it's always been there. So her presence and her death have been a part of who our, our life is. And, how we were, how we came up, we'll never forget her, even though we didn't get to know her. Trinity. So Trinity plays a Carol in the play. And one of the things I talked to Trinity about this week is how did you take on this role? What did it feel? 
feel like placing yourself in the in, in just the, the the character or the body of this 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 little girl that um, you've never met before, but you had obviously had to do a lot of research, right? Right. Tell us a little bit about what it what it was like just um, taking on her persona and just understanding the tragedy. That um, that actually connected your lives together because you're you know playing her in this life. Um, when I first received the role, I was honored, but I was also scared because I wanted to make sure that I was able to honor her life in the way that she deserves. Um, something that the director did to us is that she never sugarcoated anything. She never sugarcoated the seriousness of what this play means, what it could mean, and what it like did mean in 1963. And I think that helped me to understand and to um, pull Carol out of me. But also, I keep going back, our director also made sure that we understood that I am Carol and Carol is me. And in, in the way that we were both young, I mean, sorry, we were both young African-American girls, the difference is that I'm able to continue on, I'm blessed to continue on with my life and she was not. Um, and so in that, in that same regard, I would like to say that when I'm on stage, I'm thinking about it could have been me. It could still be me. Um, and so that's what I try to think about every night when I'm frozen in Carol's <laughs> um, position. Thank you for sharing that. That's, that's great. That's great. Uh, Congresswoman Sewell, uh, you talked about one of your first pieces of legislation that you signed was related to this incident. Can you tell us a little bit more about that and what led to that? Because we understand, you know, in order for legislation to be passed, you know, there has to be someone saying this needs to be done. And I know that you have a history of your parents being involved in the civil rights movement, and it, it was just kind of a part of your life. Tell us a little bit more about why this was important to you. Well, first let me just say, you have got to see the play. Yeah. These young people will make, have made us so proud. You all are amazing. I saw it last night. And to be sitting next to Trinity, I just get goosebumps. I said to them when I talked to you all last night that um, I really wanted to be a thespian. <laughs> Some would say I'm acting as a congresswoman now. <laughs> so you all are li literally living out uh, one of my dreams. But I wanted to also just say uh, to the Alabama Shakespeare Festival and to the Birmingham uh, public school system, what a great collaboration. Uh, and it is a conversation uh, to, to actually think about the fact that these four little girls' lives were cut so short and what's possible. Lisa, you're going to love it. I know you're going to see it tonight. And um, the person who plays Denise is in the audience, will you stand up? She's awesome. Awesome. So, you know, it's never lost on me that I get to walk the halls of Congress because four little girls lost their lives. And so I carry with me every day, I think I shared that with you, Lisa, that I am the embodiment of Addie Mae, of Cynthia, of Carol, of Denise. And we have to say their names and give life to um, the uh, notion of just being four little girls. But it's never lost on me. And so I was honored that uh, my very first piece of legislation was on the 50th anniversary of their death that Congress can bestow upon anyone. It was done posthumously, and it was to Carol, Addie Mae, Cynthia, and Denise. And President Barack Obama signed it in the Oval Office. <laughs> You never forget your first piece of legislation that you pass, and this is mine, and I am just honored, and I was honored to be able to uh, just share that. And it was a full circle moment for me. Growing up in Selma, uh, after the voting rights movement, but always being very cognizant of its importance. 
uh, in the audience today is my former babysitter, who probably was the youngest uh, foot soldier who marched across that bridge, Cheyenne Webb Christberg. I actually knew Cheyenne uh, as my babysitter. Like I said, she was a cheerleader at Selma High School. My dad was a coach, and my mom was a librarian. And uh, you know, I just uh, feel blessed to always be cognizant of the place in history. But you have to know that I just saw that bridge as a portal away for me to get to get to my parents. You know, and um, I think that what's really important as Alabama's first black congresswoman is to help preserve that history of this wonderful um, um, struggle where ordinary Americans did extraordinary things. When you think about the fact that they were ordinary citizens, right, who had a grievance. And I have to say, in honor of John Lewis, non-violently <laughs> band together and change the world. Um, sometimes as Alabamians, we don't want to accept our painful history. We choose to try to reject it or not talk about it as if it's going to go away. And the reality is, if we don't tell our stories, others will. And they won't tell it the way we would tell it. So I say, as Alabamians, we embrace the good and the bad of our history. Be proud of the fact that we came through that history. And elevate the fact that we still have miles to go before we sleep. So I think that it's important to put it into context. And I was very grateful and just so honored to have your mom there in the Oval Office. I, I'm about, to, I just looking at the photo just makes me, because you understand that here's the first African American president um, signing a piece of legislation that honors the history, the sacrifice, the lives of Addie Mae Collins, Denise McNair, Cynthia Wesley, and Carol Robertson. thank you for doing this and I'm not sure I can answer it the way that you asked it but uh, but um, how did I feel I think uh, my feeling all the way from when I was 12 years old that we had a mission we had a charge to keep 
And although there was much violence around us, we were not afraid, but we became more determined. I uh, remember that um, Denise was um, at Clark with me, and that it, it happened on a Sunday, but that Monday, the uh, 11 University students had a um, memorial service and a fourth year. And it was painful um, to think about those young people, but it also forced in us a determination to keep fighting for our people, and as Ms. Park said, our people and our freedom. So, uh, we, we've talked a little bit, a lot about the history. What I would like um, for our panelists to talk about, and Trinity, I guess we'll let you take the end of the conversation, but I want from this wisdom in the, on the panel, how do you think we are teaching our young people about the stories of the civil rights? A movement and how are we instilling that pride in them? You know, are we doing a good job? You know, how, how do you rate us? You know, as a community, are we doing a good job? <laughs> okay, I um, have a definite opinion about that. Um, about maybe 10 years ago, um, or maybe longer than that, maybe up close to 15, I um, group came through town teaching young people about the civil rights movement on a 10-day journey. Organization of Sojourn to the Past, and they're based in San Francisco. They bring 150 kids here at a time. So um, they came through, and my father, who spoke to groups at that time, spoke to the group. And the founder kept asking me to come on with them, and so finally I did. Um, and it was fascinating, and I learned so much. But at that time, someone in their late 30s, um, early 40s, was grieved that the lessons that I learned on the 10-day trip at my age, I had never heard of, I did not know, it was not in my school books, and I was just pissed about it, you know, <laughs> that my education had been denied knowledge of my people and the goodness of my people and the strength of my people, which could have fed me to go along and fed others to go along in the future. So when I see things like today, when I see things like the play, and there are many other groups in your organization, what you do, it's, uh, it's wonderful. And we need to continue to do that and fight the fight because it's, all this information is yet still not in our school books. Then the next fight is we need to get it into the schools, into the school books. <laughs> The tours are nice, but you know, your organization is not going to be able to ever take all the children in the United States from there. <laughs> but um, so we need to fight that all of these stories get in the school books of every student in the United States of America because this is American history, our shared American history, and we all need to know it and all need to benefit from it. But I think we can do much better. I think that it's, it's on us. Uh, and if we don't become more active with the Board of Education and the elected officials to be sure that our history is told. And um, I pledge myself to become more involved. The more I see, the more I try to do. And we do 30 students every summer. But um, I think we need to begin to partner with other people that's doing it so we can have a more uh, effective, a stronger effect. I think what's interesting about that, Ms. Crenshaw, and I value the work that you do, but it's time for people in my generation to take a charge up. You know, what, what, are, what are we doing? What are the ones younger than us doing? You know, Ms. Crenshaw can't do it all. She has, she has laid the foundation. Um, and she has fought the fight. How, how and when do we pick up that torch? That's what we need to be discussing and, and talking about. Um, Congresswoman Sewell, would you like to add a, a little bit about 
you know, what what you see yourself as, uh, how you are contributing to the continued history. Mm -hmm. and to to lifting up this history. I mean, you did a big job with that legislation. Now that was good. That was the number one. You know, but how are how are you continuing it, and how are you planning to continue? How how are you wanting to continue to invest in these communities like Selva? Everywhere you cover, you know, what are what can we do as a community, and how can we reach out to these other communities, um, especially our youth, to be able to to lift up this history and tell these stories? Well, first of all, let me just say um, we stand. We come from amazing stock. We should be proud of the heritage and celebrate it every day, not just Black History Month. And I think it's important that everyone play a role because as you so eloquently said, Lisa, it's not just our history, it's American history. So all of us are Black history, all of us have a voice that we can amplify and talk about the contributions of African Americans, but also the sacrifices that have been made by generations of people, black and white. I mean, I think about the fact that we enjoyed such great freedoms today. I, I cannot imagine. I, I'm three generations Selma, maybe four generations Selma. My dad, who was uh, recently he was deceased, but he was this big, towering man. Can't imagine, I couldn't imagine as a child, him drinking from a fountain that said, colored over. In many ways, that was a credit to the community that we no longer could even imagine those days. But we are doing a disservice if we don't tell our young people about those days. Those who don't know it, their history are bound to repeat their history. And so, I think it's incredibly important that the great district that I represent, which happens to be the poorest district in the state of Alabama, but all what we lack in economic prosperity, we more than make up for in heart and in fight and in spirit. We brought the world, the civil rights movement, the voting rights movement, and in turn, the world human rights movement. So we have to figure out a way to leverage this amazing history to bring economic prosperity to our area. I am so excited about bringing faith and politics and the members of Congress uh, this year to my district. We start in Birmingham every year. John Lewis leads a pilgrimage. And this year, we're going to have over 30 members of Congress, Republicans and Democrats, coming to Alabama, Birmingham, and then to come to Montgomery and to see the Rosa Parks Museum, to see the Freedom Rides, to see EJI and the lynching memorial. I mean, we have to leverage our history and tell our stories and leverage it for economic prosperity, tourism. We don't tell our stories, others will, it's important. So one of the things that I'm most proud of, frankly, is getting in a President Obama for the 50th anniversary of the March from Selma to Montgomery, to have the Department of the Interior do grants specifically for historic preservation of civil rights sites. And while he and his budget allocated 50 million for the 50th anniversary, we only got seven. I am proud to say that since 2015 to now, we are now at $13 million specifically for historic preservation of civil rights sites, of which 50% have come to our district. And we now have $5 million specifically for historic civil rights sites on the campuses of historic black colleges helping their infrastructure. So, part of my job is to honor the past, preserve the past, but advance the legacy. And we all can do that. 
How do we make it relevant to millennials and young folks, Generation X? And, I mean, the words of Martin Luther King, injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. They understand injustice. You know, everybody understands injustice. We need to put into context the struggle and talk about how it relates to the struggles that you all feel when it comes to crime or criminality, when it comes to uh, you know, uh, violence, violence against women, bullying, all of that. We've got to put it into some context. So we all can do our part. I really feel very strongly that we can leverage uh, our history in this great um, district and make it an economic uh, bonus and not, and, and, and not a liability by continuing to tell our story. But the key is to make sure young people, which is probably why I was so moved by last night's play, um, the fact that you all captured the spirit of a movement and the voices of that generation, young people, and talking about the children's crusade. Because after all, it was young people who were in Kelly Ingram Park being hosed by dogs because their parents were too busy at work. Their parents had the threat of losing their jobs, losing their livelihood. So it was young people, a young, I don't know what possessed, what courage you must have had to be eight years old, Cheyenne, and want to like, and sneak into all those midnight masses and, and, and to march. But I thank you, we all thank you. But it's not enough to say thank you. to say thank you, Ms. Crenshaw. I say it every time I see her. What am I doing to advance that legacy? What am I doing to move it? And all of us can do something. All of us can do something. And you can do it where you are. My mom loves to say, bloom where you're planted. You don't have to be a member of Congress to make a difference. And sometimes people would say members of Congress don't make a difference. <laughs> you, you can do more in your capacity as an American citizen to advance democratic reform, to fight injustice when you see it. And all you need to be is a citizen of this great country, which is why voting, I mean, really? Can we not vote? <laughs> why? I don't understand why everyone doesn't go rush into the polls to vote. When you think about the threat, and it's a modern day threat, old battles have become new again. Old battles have become new again. So what will your generation, how will your generation harness the lessons of the generation of Doris Crenshaw? You know, they were not, these just were, wasn't happenstance that they chose Selma. They were tacticians. They were brilliant strategists these marchers. So we've got to learn from that history and advance that history. I just hope to be able to speak as passionately as you one day. Um, <laughs> You're doing it now. <laughs> um, I'd like to take a moment to reflect on my experience. I have been a, a member of Montgomery Public School since kindergarten, and I'm now a senior. Um, and so I- you where? I'm a senior at Booker T. Washington Madison. Um, something that I can say is that I can see the efforts throughout my childhood of going to the Rosa Parks Museum, um, doing a little history assignment here and there, but the efforts have been half done. Um, they have been almost routine in that they take away the importance of it. It's once the children uh, the children, once we uh, <laughs> um, do it every year, it kind of becomes, I hate to say this, old news. It kind of becomes, why are we still talking about the same two people? Like, oh my gosh, we know what they did, we know, but do we, we, do we really know? Are we focusing on the stories that not everyone is, has access to? Um, the history books are limited um, when it comes to the melanated history um, because they, <laughs> They speak about maybe time and place, but not really the importance. <laughs> they, speak on, they speak on time and place, but not really the importance of um, what these people really did, what they went through in their everyday lives. Um, 
August Wilson said it when he was talking about his mission as a playwright, how if you don't see yourself reflected in the culture, you, your self-worth kind of diminishes over time. And I think that um, as a young person, I have been able to build up my self-worth by um, you know, listening to my, my family's from Alabama, so um, listening to my grandmother um, speak about how she did not engage in any type of desegregation practices because she had to feed her 10 kids. Um, so to make that decision between, am I gonna have my family or am I gonna be able to be treated equally, equally as a human being? Um, and then my mom and my dad always encouraging me, like, you should watch Ruby, um, you should watch Malcolm X, um, you, you should know about these stories that aren't being taught every day, and you should value them and you should learn from them. And I think that children of any race should be encouraged to learn about the civil rights movement um, in general just because it increases a passion within you to say, I can change them, I can change the world because they did. They weren't um, rich people who had all these funds and all these um, parents that were telling them like, you, the parents were at work, like as you just said. Um, they were young people just like us. And I think that when you actually digest these stories, you can understand that you have the same thing within you. Um, so yeah, um, also to speak on your question earlier about how your generation can inform millennials. Wait, wait, are you a millennial generation? No. Okay. <laughs> but thank you. ALP, where are I think that doing things like how the Alabama Shakespeare Festival has taken this story and made young people tell it. Yes. I think that the best way to educate young people is through young people. Yes. Um, I can say, um, being on stage, I can only see the first row because the lights are really bright. Um, but and I, hot. <laughs> yes, and hot. But I can say that when I look into their faces, you know, when I glance into their faces, they're like this. Yeah. They can't wait to see what's going to happen next, and they're being educated while being entertained. Yes. And I think that we sometimes, the entertainment industry, that's a whole other subject, but um, we sometimes don't give it enough credit for its influence on young people, especially in 2019. Yes. Um, so, yeah. <laughs> it's very interesting that you uh, mentioned educating um, your peers, like your white peers. Um, one of the things that when we talk about history and from a, you know, from I think always from a social work perspective, we, we focus, we look at behavior. So when we talk about history repeating itself, we are talking, also talking about behaviors not changing. So think about that. When we see a lot of the stuff in the past and we look at what's going on in the present, it's just in a different form, but the behaviors are still the same. So when you talk about engaging the audience of your, uh, of your white peers, how do we get them in the room? Like you said, entertaining them and educating them at the same time. You know, how do we bridge this gap? Because we do understand that there's a level of privilege. And when I say privilege, you know, people not having to worry about certain things or not having to, right, not thinking about it, not even being concerned about it. How do we get them in the room, you know, thank, thank God that, that Shakespeare did this play to get some of the students in the room. But how do we continue this conversation in education, uh, especially if it's not being taught in the books? Because it's our, it's our shared history, you know, and we all have a responsibility to have our voice in that history. How do we get your peers in the room? Um, I think, especially speaking on white peers, just having a lot less judgment. Um, there is a lot of guilt that goes along with the history, um, specifically the stories that are told about the violence um, of the civil rights movement and what um, I think a lot of my peers when they hear about their ancestors and how like maybe they weren't the best of people um, it kind of scares them and it, it makes them feel like they should be excluded from the conversation they don't have the right to be there but I think inviting them in and saying okay do you have 
questions do you, what are, what are you not understanding um, the conversation about the N-word is something that has had to be had um, multiple times because they're like, well, I just don't understand. And it's like maybe if somebody will just sit, if it's not somebody, if we as young people will sit down and have no judgment and just be like, what questions do you have? So, and I'm thinking about, you know, when you said guilt, there's also a, a sense of shame associated with our history, right? So we don't talk about that shame, you know, and we can't really reconcile something that we have not addressed, you know. So how, how can we, and, and this is for any of the panelists, how are we doing a good job of being inclusive? And this is, you know, going to the conversation of allies. You know, um, sometimes our, our, our white peers say things that are wrong or things that are offensive, how do we address that? Are we addressing it lovingly? You know, because it's, it's still in our shared history, we have this shame. How are we talking about it on both sides? Um, my parents, uh, just give you a little background, my parents, um, while Denise lived in a segregated Birmingham, my parents made sure that we lived in an integrated Birmingham. So we went to private school, which was predominantly white. So a lot of my background is with white people. And currently, I work at a job, and I'm the only black person. I go to church, and it's about 20 of us out of 16,000 white people. And so I live in a condo, and I think there are only two black people. So I'm around white people all the time. So, um, but that has given me the wonderful opportunity to get to know them and them get to know me and to feel comfortable from, with me. And I feel as an African American person who has that platform, they will come to me and ask questions. And I need to be open and share with them our story and what they don't know. So in my desire, my hope is that they will go back and share with others of their race what they don't know in a compassionate way and understand that, hey, this just well, didn't happen to some people. This happened to some people who were human beings and Americans, and we should have love for them. Um, had a number of people that reach out to me and say, do you give tours of the Civil Rights Institute? Do you give tours of the church? Like, you know, I'm like, I do, that's my job. <laughs> but I do it, and you know, I say, sure, I'd be happy to go with you. And, um, and then, because that, it leaves me, I, I'm, I have them for a captive audience yeah. to tell them what's going on in a loving, kind, compassionate way, and we can ask questions. If they have questions, if they have dialogue, if they feel guilt, if they feel uncomfortableness, we can work through that. Um, I had a friend that wanted to go to Dr. King's 50th anniversary of his bomb, I mean, of his murder in April of, of last year. She paid, and there was a conference there, a church conference there. <laughs> about the Dr. King, which was mostly uh, white evangelical. So we went to that, she paid for the conference and everything, and we went to that civil rights movement, the museum there. She wanted it, she was taking pictures and everything. And we got to the Emmett Till part of it, and she was like, Emmett Till, who is that? And so inside my head, I'm like, you know who Emmett Till is? <laughs> Where you be? You know that, but I can't say that as a nice Christian Southern person. <laughs> so inside, I said, "Well, let me tell you about Emmett Till." <laughs> so I go on to tell the whole story of Emmett Till, so she would understand. And she was devastated and taking pictures and everything. And um, but all of us as African Americans, we saw that picture in Jet Magazine, Jet Magazine all our life. We knew that whole story. But that goes back to showing you what I was not taught about our story that day, and so we have to be uh, advocates for that in a loving, compassionate way so that we can break the barriers. That's exactly why, that's great. That's exactly why I think it's important for my colleagues, Republicans and Democrats, we talk about bringing civility back to Congress. Oh, pray on that one, okay? <laughs> but it starts with us seeing each other not as red or blue, 
not as Republicans or Democrats, not as black or white, but as human beings who all have certain needs, desires, aspirations for ourselves and our families. And so we have to be ambassadors, all of us, of the human race, and be uh, judged by how we treat people. So don't be ashamed of what your ancestors did. What are you doing to make it better? To, to, as, that, as this current generation, what are you doing, right? And it's not enough to say I have one black friend or one white friend, one Hispanic friend. It's, it's about being inclusive and, and really being intentional about it. Uh, and I think that you only, you only know what you know. You only have, you have your experience. You can never invalidate someone else's experience, but you can learn from their experience, right? And we shouldn't be threatened by their experience, right? But I think that it's so important that we teach one, teach one, educate each other, and be open to educating and not judge. Because that's the only way that I think that we really progress. I have the audience a person who helped me get into Princeton University, which changed my life forever. Julian McPhillips, thank you, Julian. But growing up in Selma, I only knew black and white. I go off to this Ivy League school woefully unprepared. Thank God, I often have to just say, and I just am grateful, Julian, that Princeton affirmatively went looking for people like me. Some will call it affirmative action. I like to think that the 3.8 that I got at Princeton was on me. <laughs> but Princeton affirmatively went looking for people who don't, who weren't privileged, who didn't, to give us a shot. What we did with that shot, and that's all affirmative action is, people. Give me an opportunity. Acknowledge that my mom was brilliant, brilliant, and went to Alabama State, the Alabama State University. <laughs> now, she would have been well prepared to go to Princeton, but never had an opportunity. So I want to thank the university, but most importantly, I want to thank an alum from Montgomery, Alabama, who had the audacity um, to help find a diamond in the rough. The leap from Selma High School to Princeton was the biggest leap of my life. Princeton, Oxford, Oxford, Harvard Law School, Harvard Law School, partner, law firm, member of Congress, small leaps. But what I was gonna say is, I go to the Princeton, black and white is all I knew, growing up in Selma, Alabama. I move into my freshman dorm, and we're late arriving, because my dad had to drive, because he didn't believe in flying. Lord didn't mean for you to go anywhere. If, uh, you couldn't drive to it. <laughs> so we get there late. And I walk in and I meet my freshman roommate for the first time and she goes, oh my God, I'm so glad I'm not the only minority um, in, this, uh, in this dorm room. And I said, uh, she's, she's white with, with curly black hair. I didn't get what she, I, was like, I only see one minority here. <laughs> and she tells me, I'm Jewish. <laughs> I met my first Hispanic person. I met my first Guatemalan person. I met my first, we only know what we know. But we have to broaden our horizons and see the common humanity. The world is full of shades of gray. It's not simply black and white, and I mean literally black and white, and figuratively black and white. The world is full of shades of gray. Xenophobia and racism comes from people not being exposed by choice or otherwise with other cultures. When you shriek it all down, she may have gone to the prep school and blah, 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 but she has a heritage of being Jewish that she's proud of. And she taught that to me. And I taught her my heritage. And we're all the better for it. We still may not understand each other, but it's okay to say, I don't understand. Can you help me? 
But don't judge me because I don't know. I was never taught, never exposed. So when I said, excuse me, you're white with curly hair, I know I only see one minority up in here. <laughs> she had to educate me. And now I am educating you. All right. I mean, I learned that self-interest is the prevailing force. Yes. And as we went around the country engaging people to become involved in the civil rights movement, or like whatever we were doing in that city, we started in one house, in a living room. And, and later, when we went out and somebody was hit or got hurt, then we had filled the living room because their family member was involved. My point is, if you understand that it's in your self-interest to get involved, most of the time you get involved. But the other thing is that when I grew up, there were many sessions like this with people, young people. Yes. And young people organized the meetings. So we try to provide an opportunity. Let me say this to you. I need a commercial break here. Yeah. <laughs> One of my students is in the play, Charles Hunter. Awesome. <laughs> but we have to feel it. And we felt it. Well, I find that we do need to talk more to our young people. Yes. We talk at them. Mm -hmm. I was in an organization where they said, we got to get the young people, we got to get young people. Old people don't get young people. <laughs> <laughs> young people are answer to young people. They're peers, so it should be upon us starting today to begin conversations in living rooms and wherever to engage our young people. Now, Charles, you know, uh, uh, you can tell them that Southern youth, they are forced to talk about it. And they uh, experience through us and our history. But we all can do this in this city. We all can have students in our living rooms and talk. I see George at number, the greatest talk. Starting with the, uh, if we start with the Montgomery bus boycott, yeah. women and youth. So us women got to start to involve our youth. All of the movements in the world, men and men down, women and youth. Selma, Amelia Point. Oh, that's right. Women and Cheyenne Hughes. <laughs> Huh? In Birmingham, we had women. I remember going to Birmingham to the state NAACP meeting with um, Rosa Parks. And the people mostly that, that took care of us and talked were the women. And all of my life, women have been the prevailing force. Uh, Coretta King, Dorothy Height, Rosa Parks, you name it. So, they often didn't get the credit. Wait, wait, wait. We can't let the men off the hook. No. Nah. <laughs> okay. So uh, I'm proposing that we organize the Women and Youth Forum, Congresswoman, in this city for around next February or March, Women History Month, <laughs> and involve women and youth around. Uh, can I get an amen? Amen. But I think it's important, and, and Madam uh, Monterey, why don't we give the microphone to some of the students? Oh, yeah. Yeah. oh but we are in your program. <laughs> about you speaking about the Emmett Till situation that happened when and then you speaking about how we sh how you can educate the youth. I had a friend, 
17 years old, I was 15. Um, we were sitting talking on her bed and she told me, oh, okay, she told me that racism no longer existed, it was something of the past. And um, we, we, I, we were just talking about um, um, a police shooting that had just occurred and her synthesis was just not valid. And so I was like, well, how can you do that? How can you say something like that? What about little boys like Emmett Till? And she said, oh, she was African American, by the way. Um, and, and she said, who? From Montgomery, 17 years old, racism no longer exists. And she could not tell me who Emmett Till was. So we sat there, pulled it up on our phones, and together, <laughs> we went through the events that happened, what happened, and then what happened afterwards, and how it was a catalyst. Um, and so that just speaks on how you were saying that youth can't educate youth. Your voice does matter. I'm sitting right here on this panel today, and I'm trying to tell you guys, like, it doesn't matter how old you are. Um, the only way to change the world, I feel like, is to educate people, because ignorance is dangerous. Um, Say it again. Ignorance is dangerous. So yeah. Um, thank you so much because I think that the when we move forward, as Miss Crenshaw says, we need to bring women and children together because we know the, the the nurturing impact of yeah the future. The future, you're absolutely right. Um, and just the uh, just the the power of women. I tell people all the time because you know a lot of times growing up as a um, a black female, I wasn't heard a lot of positive things about myself. But right now, it's a good time to be a black girl. <laughs> yes. yes, yes, yes. Excited about that, and I'm glad you made that transition because I want to be able to talk about what's giggling up. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. I want to be able to talk about the Nina Simone play, which I encourage every woman to see, especially black women, go see this because we'll see a lot of a lot of different things that we we talk about in our community, but we don't necessarily talk about in our community. It's in a book. Now, a lot of us read books these days, but it's, it, they're in books. People, people write about them. So when we talk about women, first I want to talk about, um, in, in the civil rights movement, I want to be able to talk about some of the sexism that was related, and this play brings this out. One of the things when I was watching, um, when I was watching the play, it was mentioned that when Dr. King was marching, women were not allowed to march beside him. We had to march in the back. So what was that about? You know, so. A lot of it had to do with safety. That's right. That's right. But having said that, um, they were great chauvinists. In the movement. <laughs> in America. I mean, and, well, well, okay, yes, in America. But if, if, if you look, look at the film and the first mass meeting, Rosa Parks was known to poem. Rosa Parks didn't speak, it was the me. And uh, throughout the movement, and, and part of it was with us because we wanted to. Um, advanced our men. But then it got to a point where we said, enough is enough of this. <laughs> <laughs> but we're tired of the blind <laughs> So we had to step forward. But there was a lot of that. And there still is a lot of that. Uh, I remember in, in Montgomery when I first moved back, and I would go to these churches and the meetings, and I'd look at the pulpit, and it was all on men. So I showed Alvin Holmes, I said, y'all don't have no women that can sit on the stage. <laughs> he said, you want to sit up here? I said, no, no. <laughs> but I was very disappointed in the will of the women in the city. They, we take a lot of stuff that we don't have to take. 
Be that the way you want to go. I, 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 I won't let you be the moderator. No, no, but, but, I got one. Yeah. <laughs> What's interesting that I was going to continue to talk about is, you know, I'm glad that you said that it was about safety because, you know, when I heard the play, I mean, when I heard that line in the play, that was one of the things that I really did consider. Also, um, one of the lines in the play said that if our own men see us as a threat, no wonder white men see us as one too. So, were we seen as a threat? Was that even considered, or when we think about civil, when we think about women today and our advocacy and our leadership, are we being seen as a threat? Where, where is our voice in this? Can we, are we being heard enough in this? And Congresswoman, I want you to touch on that because you are in a male-dominated environment, you know, and it's. And, and, some, and how, are, uh, how are you banding together as women, with, sometimes with different ideologies, coming together and advocating for your voice and the needs of women? And just, just generally, you know, uh, the rights of everyone. How is that happening? So I'm very proud to be a member of the 116th Congress, where we have more women, yeah. more diverse women. <laughs> First Muslim woman, first Native American woman of the Mountain Congress. And that really came out of a movement, a women's march, when we saw injustice coming out of the mouth of the most powerful person in America. Women's march. And um, here's what I know for a fact. Sexism and racism in America is still alive and well. And we all have a part to play in educating and learning and trying to uh, overcome that. I will tell you that uh, when asked a question that I asked Shirley Chisholm, I had the great honor of interviewing her uh, for my thesis in college. At the time she was retired, she's the first African, for those of you who don't know who Shirley Chisholm is, <laughs> She was the first African-American woman to walk the halls of Congress as a member of Congress. She represented Brooklyn, New York, and they put her on agriculture committee. That's all I need to tell you about that. But she took, made lemonade out of lemons because we had, she decided, agriculture is about growing food. Food is about nutrition, nutrition assistance for women, for children. Some call it food stamps now, or SNAP is a program that she brought because she was on the agriculture committee. So you can turn lemonade, lemons into lemonade. But um, I interviewed her for my thesis and I asked her a question and I often hear the same question of journalists and uh, student people you know, who interview me, ask me the same thing. As between being black and a woman, which was the biggest barrier to your getting into politics? She looked at me and she said, unequivocally, being a woman. <laughs> 38 years later, I'm saying exactly the same thing. Unequivocally, being a woman was a bigger barrier than being black. We got work to do. We have work to do. Now, some of it was paternalistic. You know, I, would, I, uh, I had a woman um, campaign uh, uh, manager, and she and I would go to the back roads of the Black Belt uh, for these endorsement conferences, and they would be late at night. And, you know, several of the men would walk, see us walking to the car and go, oh my God, how you gonna get back to Birmingham? We're like, uh, we drive. <laughs> Just the two of you? What if you get a flat? I pulled out my, um, a, my AAA card, and, my, and, and T2, who was the name of she said, oh, my daddy taught me how to uh, change a tire. We're gonna be okay. Um, but so some of it was paternalistic. 
can't tell you how many people came up to me and said, oh, this, this is the prime of your life. You should be having children, not going to Congress. You should be finding a husband. It's a form of paternalism, too. But I mean, the reality is that we as women have to disprove the myth by just doing what we do. I have to tell young girls that the research shows that women have to be asked eight times before they actually think about running, think about running for an elected office. So I see so many young folks in this audience, so many amazing women in this audience. I am begging you to take your experience, not just into elective office, but in our community and, st and making a, a, a stand in our community because we need your voice. Here's what I know for a fact. We as women are naturally, I think, the perfect legislators. What do you do as a legislator? You multitask, you mediate. We mediate every day. We negotiate, we're, but we're often the budgeters in our family. We, I, don't, I venture to guess if a majority of women were in Congress, we wouldn't have the deficit that we have. <laughs> our natural talents and strengths that we bring. We're natural talkers and negotiators. I mean, when we had that fiscal cliff, and I know we go to government shutdown all the time, um, one, uh, they made a joke in the Alabama delegation lunch that if all they needed was Martha and I to sit in a room with one bottle of wine, when well, we said to you, but <laughs> give us a couple hours, and we negotiated a, a reopening of government, and they were probably right. Two people from different uh, political parties, but who have a common interest. We need to get on with this. People need to get paid. Our national security is at risk. This is our job. People sent us there to be a part of the solution, not a part of the problem. But I found it really interesting that, um, uh, really interesting that it was our men, you know, they were kidding, I guess. But we were looking at each other going, that's not a bad idea. <laughs> and so I think that, um, I think that, you know, I may be the first, but Amelia Boynton Robinson Thank you. ran for Congress in the 7th Congressional District in 1964 yes. so that Terry Sewell could win right. in 2010. <laughs> Stop, and you do too. You should have exactly that same passion and sense of entitlement. Because <laughs> right? others fought the hard fight, they did the heavy lifting. We don't have colored only, white only anymore. But we still have racism. We still have. It's insidious, it's not as overt, sometimes it is, sometimes it's not. But what are we all doing to pay it forward? To say thank you to the prior generation, but move it forward. And as women, I think that sometimes we can be our biggest obstacle and our biggest barrier. Because the question about family and children, I got asked mostly from my women constituents. Let's not judge each other. Let's uplift each other. Amen. I, 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 never, I never ask that question. I mean, no one's worried about their I, I listen to the kinds of questions that Martha gets. You, you have young children. How, how are they getting to school? She's like, uh, Riley, their daddy, is taking <laughs> I didn't see the play in this moment, and I would, I'm, I'm looking forward to going and seeing it. But when you said colorism, I thought immediately about this whole, we as black women sometimes dog other black women for a whole 
host of reasons. That's right. And we gotta stop that. That's right. That's right. We all get it together. I don't care if you're a Delta or an AK, I don't care. <laughs> Light skin or dark skin, we all in this trouble. Right? And I wanna say to our men, I swear to God, it wasn't until I was in college, I could have been in college anywhere, because my daddy told me that I was beautiful. I didn't get the memo that as a dark-skinned black woman, I wasn't supposed to succeed, I wasn't attractive. It wasn't until I got to college that someone told me, you can't be an AKA because you're dark-skinned. I said, I mean, you know, black women in the audience know what I'm talking about. We have got to stop that. We've got to stop that. We're all beautiful. God created everyone in this room that we are all beautiful. And we're going to be beautiful. Right? And we all have a talent. Great advice from Nancy Sewell, my mom. My job is to, I have the, God has blessed me with these children, and everybody got a talent. My job as a mom is to figure out what the talent is. Now they just, early on they said Terry was talking. <laughs> and I say to the young folks, and the reason why I, I so passionately talk about workforce development and skills training and everybody having a skill is because when, when I'm not, uh, when the recession hit, lawyers got fired, politicians, I mean, oh you know, you're the win. What talent did I have besides talking? <laughs> All of us need a skill. All of us need a skill. <laughs> so, Andrew and Anthony, my brothers, oh, she went through baseball, softball, soccer, uh, you know, gotta find talent. All of us have strengths, and I think that as a community, we should try to figure out and mentor our young people. All of us can do that wherever we are. We don't have to have a program called Big Brothers, Big Sisters, or to, have a, to mentor our youth. And sitting at the feet of Doris Crenshaw has been one of the best experiences for me, and I know for you too, Shania. Yes. Wisdom. Yes. She can't yes. stop me from making mistakes. She can tell me what being in these situations did for her and how she handled it. And then she'll end it by saying, now you do what you're gonna do. <laughs> <laughs> but, but she can truly say that she done told us what she thinks. <laughs> and it's of great value. <clears throat> you see, she's already given me an assignment from this panel. <laughs> <laughs> and she does to me to this day in our panel. And it's everybody. Yeah, it's everybody. And I think, I, I think that you made a very good point because as we have this wisdom in the room, we have to be open to receive that. Yes. You know, and, and I think that people forget that component, the openness, the willingness to, to listen, to be a part of this conversation, and to, understanding, to understand that um, there are people before us that, as you said, made the sacrifice, Absolutely. and you know. And some ultimate sacrifice. Right, some ultimate sacrifices, and they paved the way just to make it a little bit better for us. And we have to be able to embrace that. Ms. McNair, did you want to add anything? I uh, just want to piggyback on something that uh, Terry said. Um, uh, you know, I used to get that, when you gonna get married? When you gonna get a, you know, have some cheer? Well, how are you gonna have no cheer? Like, really? <laughs> you don't know how that happens or why that didn't happen? <laughs> um, and it's just annoying, and so I try never to ask people those two questions. But um, I think that everybody's not meant to be married, and everybody's not meant to have babies. That's not our goal. That's not where God put us. She has two kids, and one of them's like, I guess like middle school, whatever. And they took, she's like me, she goes to that same private all-white school. And they took her kid to at uh, Civil Rights Institute yesterday. Well, she texted me saying that her child was scream crying. But she got to the part about the four little girls. And she couldn't understand why God would do something like that. And, and my friend didn't know what to do with her daughter. 
She was so overwhelmed. She's not from here. And so she let me talk to her. And, um, you know, she's like me. She's around white people all the time. She's concerned about her getting to know about her blackness, but also being at peace about that. So I don't have any kids. I have a dog. <laughs> and the Lord just let me know, okay, I'm going to have to start spending time with that lady's daughter. And that lady works a lot. I might have to take her to Jack and Jill, get involved in Jack and Jill or something to take her. But that's my walk. Because I don't have kids. And maybe God didn't mean for me to have kids so that I could be a support or a mentor to somebody else's child to help them fill in the gap. Because like, you know, Hillary said in the early on, it takes a village. But that just spoke to me and it stayed with me. And after she called me and texted me, and I was so strong and for and I was good. I said, my God, I just cried like a baby. And, uh, but I'm not going to forget that child. I can't forget that child. And we all have to find the child and take him and work with her or him and expose him to all the stuff we know, all the beauty we've learned, all the wisdom, all the foolishness we've done, and, and help them to know about our history, and all of our shared American history. I really do think that that is important. And a lot of times when I, um, especially young women that are close to me, one of the things that I give them when they're, get, when they're getting ready to go off in the world, I have this eraser, this big eraser, and it says for big mistakes. <laughs> and I always tell them, you go make them, and don't make them so big, we can't cover them up. <laughs> you know? So um, what I would like to do at this time is open the room up to the audience. I know that there's people that want to say things, and, and you, want, you have questions, and you would like to um, share or maybe ask some questions of the panelists. So what we want to do right now is to be able to open the room up to you. And I want to hear from our young people. One of the things I want uh, to honestly hear from you, and I see you, you know, <laughs> I want y'all to come up here. Y'all come up here. Y'all come up here. Up here. Up here. Up here. One of the things that we want to be able to hear from you is what can we do for you? Yes. How can we support you on this journey? We are a village. And we, but we need to know what we can do for you and to help support you. So I'm going to open it up. Um, I don't know if this mic is going to do it. No. We can get as far as the cable will let you go. <laughs> All right, well, we'll have a hot spot up front. Just come, come and talk to us. Come and talk to us. Good job. generation. I feel like a great way to influence them is by entertainment. Because what they, um, we can't, um, and to piggyback on what Ms. Crenshaw said, to recruit um, um, young people, I don't think old people have the right materials. Not saying they can't, but um, <laughs> it's, it's more, it's more, um, it's more easier to get um, young people to recruit young people because they can relate to them and they know like their interests and stuff. And so um, what um, young people today are influenced by is um, entertainment and what they see on TV or social media, how um, like rappers today and singers today, how they want to be just like them. Like every, everybody wants to be a basketball player or a rapper and stuff, but they don't want to be like nurses, politicians, the work in the government and stuff. And I feel like um, if um, actually us doing this performance really um, influences us to like be better than, um, be the best of what we can be 
and be greater than rappers. Not um, dissing any rappers, they're good, but like, we, have, we have enough of them. We have enough of them. But, um, we, need, we need to see more um, diversity in our governments and um, our leaders and, um, and presidents. And, um, and so I feel like um, us as young people, we have like, people um, back, in the, back in the day have set the foundation for us and I feel like we need to build onto it to help our future. Because we as young kids have so much potential and we can do so much, so many great things. We just need to take our first step forward. Oh. I think it was interesting what, he, he just gave us a charge. He gave us a charge to be better role models. You know, show these young people that there are social workers, there are attorneys in the room, there are doctors in the room, there are people in our community that are doing positive things in the workforce. Um, and like we have a politician in the room, you know, so we- Public we, servant. Public <laughs> servant. <laughs> that, that sounds like <laughs> but we do have people in our community, and I think that one of, um, you know, when I think about, especially Monroe Street and the history of it, that's when we had a lot of our black doctors and lawyers and pharmacists and, you know, and restaurants right here on this back street. You know, but, uh, you know, how are we, uh, how are we connecting that and showing that to our youth? So that's a charge for us. So I wanted to lift that up. Okay. Hi, I'm Gaia Moore. I go to BTW, Magnet High School. I play Sarah, Addie Mae Collins' little sister. The fifth little girl. <laughs> the fifth little girl that survived. I have the mommy. Uh, a way that we could help educate young people would be to influence us with music. We listen to songs every day, almost every day. <laughs> So like taking the information and putting it into songs with a catchy beat. <laughs> uh, that would help us understand better. Oh, yeah. Uh, but uh, telling it through art is a way to help us see it better. Um, hello, my name is Lexi Hennessy. I'm a part of the ensemble part of the play, and I get to work with uh, these wonderful people up here. Um, I think one thing we can't like devalue our opinions, like our education, because we're learning from the people before us, and we're learning like now, like different ways that racism is still implemented and how the school to school to school pipeline that leads to mass incarceration of people of color mainly and it's just like don't devalue what we have to say because we we have opinions too Hello, my name is Andarius Porter. I'm a junior at Booker T. Washington Magnet High School. And he plays? Um, Chris McNair. Oh my God! <laughs> so, um, recently in English class, uh, we had the opportunity to write college essays. And my last essay was about what is a generational problem today? And um, I talked about that my generation, we have a problem with being disrespectful. And it's just, it's not to other people, but it's to ourselves. Um, my three points were, my first, my first point were disrespectful to our, our, our elders, I'm sorry. Um, and it's not all of us. It's, you know, that old saying, one, one bad apple spoils the whole bunch? Yeah. That's what we get nowadays. And um, I use an example, like if you see an older woman walk into the car and she's struggling with groceries, and you go and help her and she's being a little, she's a little frightened because she don't know how you're gonna respond. So that's a, that's a 
problem that we need to fix in our, with my generation. Um, I am. You smile and like she said, smile. <laughs> and as uh, I'm about to run for Alabama State FBLA officer, and yeah. my um, FBLA is Future Businesses of America. Um, and I'm my campaign is um, I use my name Andy P. And A is for action. N is for networking, D is for diligence, U, Y is for youthfulness, and P is for uh, privilege. You have, to, you have to first take action. You just can't wait for an adult to come to you to say, okay, um, Trinity, we need you to be on a panel. <laughs> Trinity, she, um, she is a phenomenal student, I'll just let you all know. But it's just, we need to, we need to be more mindful of how to be better students, how to be better, better youth, youth, youth in the, um, not just Alabama, but the whole state of Alabama. I mean, whole state, yeah, whole state of Alabama and then in, in the USA. I just, want, I, I just want to thank you all for ASL, um, Mr. Dildine, and the executive director for allowing us and allowing this conversation to take place. Thank you. Um, I would say just pray, because <laughs> uh, prayer does work, and uh, monetary donations as well, because uh, it's going to help, it will help you in the long run, because I do come in, a, I'm, I'm raised in a single parent household, and it's hard for me to uh, to do things because my mom has two kids and it's hard for us to um, battle between my sister and cheerleading and me with this play. So <laughs> monetary donations will help the campaign. It would not go towards me at all. It will help me win this election and uh, be a great officer for Alabama. Thank you. My name is Ashley Ford, and I'm an eighth grader at Baldwin Magnus School. Yes. Um, to answer the question, I would, I would like to say I think you adults are actually doing a very great job at supporting us. I think it's mostly our peers that put us down because we're constantly hating on each other. Like we don't want to see each other do great. And if you're not with the trend, you're lame, you know. So I want to thank y'all for supporting us, That's and right. especially in the Four Little Girls play, for the non of African Americans, like, it's hard being the one to stand up. <laughs> it's hard being the one to stand up and say the truth, you know? Because we don't, we don't speak about the truth a lot. So I want to thank the Mason, you know, for like, playing the thing. Good job. Um, I'm Mason Jeffers. Uh, I'm a freshman at Lamb. Uh, I play racist guy number one. <laughs> and you're very good. Uh, about the question about helping the youth, uh, I always think about what helped that me out the most, and uh, I guess that would be my dad, my stepdad even. Uh, yeah, I feel like dads have a responsibility to their children to you know keep them straight. you out and I know I'm not the moderator of this conversation <laughs> but I just want you to speak a bit about how sh um, the, uh, the earlier conversation that we had about how to engage non-white um, right. I mean what? Right. <laughs> yeah and, in, in the conversation that you don't have to go as far into the um, depth that you did with us but um, the conversation that we had you felt comfortable enough to express your point of view with us, and so I just wanted you to elaborate on that experience. Uh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, I didn't really uh, even acknowledge I was like the race until sixth grade. I, I didn't know. I was never taught. I, I didn't know. And I guess my first experience, know about race was uh, 
a group of African American kids that were like race shaming white people in Baltimore. That's how I learned about it. And uh, you know, I really think we just need to strive for better. And uh, if you're trying to, to teach white people, I guess you just teach them. I mean, <laughs> I, I guess there are people that are real ashamed of it. And uh, but I think we just need to grow out of that and uh, acknowledge that we didn't do it, but we can make a difference. My name is Jace White. I go to Baldwin. I'm a seventh grader, the youngest in the cast. And uh, being the youngest in the cast, I would like to say I learned a lot from the people around me. Before this play, I wasn't as educated in this specific like area as I am now. Like going to tour, touring, you know, going down downtown, learning about all that stuff. I didn't really know about it, but this play has taught me a lot, and I'm thankful for this opportunity. And um, I would like to say that we are um, we do get very disrespectful, as you said. Like we just and it. It's like, it can lead to very bad things. So we need to, I don't know, we, need to just, we just have to be better in that. And yeah, and I feel like this play, getting opportunities like these, how it taught me, I feel like that's the way that the youth can learn. So arts, being in plays, being in groups, being in camps, that's just, we just need to get, the youth in camps, and that's how we can teach them. Hello, my name is Jalen Crosby. I'm a senior at Booker T. Washington Mac in high school. <laughs> each other because we do listen to each other and I think that we need to see and I think this was a conversation before we need to look inside ourselves and realize that we have what it takes to change the world um, we need to um, increase our self-esteem um, learn keep our eyes keep our eyes open keep our minds open being open-minded all the time because it's always important to learn more um, and I think being here being in this being in this show is such an amazing opportunity, and I'm so blessed because I've learned so much from my peers and from, um, I've learned so much. Okay, I've learned so much from my peers and from my friends um, about this um, specific information about this um, experience, about this event that happened. And I think it's so important that I'm in this and that we show other young people and that they learn more. Um, and <laughs> in here at this specific event about looking at these beautiful black women, I am so inspired. Thank you. about folks like that's not 
it's like not even our race and stuff. And like, I feel like we should know our history and stuff. Mm -hmm. oh. And um, to support us, I feel like we should just build our self-esteem up and yeah, as you were saying, I think our peers is the problem in the schools with this bullying and stuff going on in NPS. And, um, yeah. As she said about learning our history, I would like to state that I did not even know there was a fifth little girl that survived the bombing. Yeah. And I just felt like that's so important. Why, why wouldn't you tell us that? You know, like that's. One of the most important things we know. So, thanks for providing this place up for me. And I got to meet her too. So. <laughs> um, you see what community is, right? And you see our future. And one thing I would love to pe would love for people to know, because I'm a product of Montgomery Public School System too. That is good stuff going on in our school. <laughs> So I wanted, to, I wanted to really lift that up, and I want to thank you all for participating, and I want to thank you all for coming out today. We are a village. Speak to these young people before you leave today. Talk to them. Engage with each other, because we are community, and this is what community looks like. Thank you so much for coming out. We will be back together on the first Saturday in March for another conversation, so look out for details, okay? Okay, all right, thank you for coming.